So good evening, everybody. Welcome to day number four, day four of our Advent retreats. Remaining calm in the storms. Remaining calm in the storms. We want to believe that you have been encountering Christ during this week in a more particular way. We want to believe that there is some calmness around all of us. So I want to say welcome once again to everybody for making out this time. And uh, tonight, we have Father Boniface Anusiem, who is going to take us on this beautiful ride, on this topic, witnessing in, this, in transit, witnessing in transit. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> when we are forming the topic, in fact, I don't know where Father Boniface is taking this topic to, but I so much, I so much, I so much believe in him. And I'm sure he's going to give us this great encounter with Christ. So Father Boniface um, will in give us a more detailed introduction of himself by the time he kicks off his talk. But Father Boniface is somebody I've known from the seminary. We attended the major seminary together. He was ahead of me and uh, he inspired me in many ways. He's in New Jersey at the moment. So Father Boniface, good to have you. If you are in the room, just say hi. Hi. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Okay, good. Good to see you, Father. Okay, before we get, um, we hand over the microphone completely to Father Boniface. I wish to remind us that tomorrow will be a little bit different. The first is that we are going to start in the morning. So tomorrow we are going to start in the morning. And uh, if you um, look on your screen, at some point we'll be flashing the timetable, the schedule. It's on your screen now, but you will also send out an email already to that effect. Um, so you look at your schedule and tomorrow we have a mini retreat. That's what it's going to look like. First class with the morning mass, then we'll have the talks and the Q&A, some little breaks in between, and then some prayers at the end. Father Albert will join us tomorrow to run the retreat. Um, we still have uh, a lot of people who have asked us to pray for them. And we have a long list now, so I'm not going to read the list of uh, the prayer intentions. But if you have sent in prayers, just bear in mind that we are united with you within this period. We're praying along with you, holding you up in prayers. I'm very, very, very optimistic that Christ is encountering you wherever you are. So on that note, I, I want to go ahead immediately with the opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of your faithful, 
Friends, that by the same Holy Spirit, we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Retreat Prayer. Jesus, you invited the apostles to come away with you to a deserted place and rest a while. Like your apostles, enable me to experience you on this Advent retreat, your suffering, love, and tender compassion. Through this online connection, may I come to better know myself, to draw closer to you, us be of better service to my brothers and sisters in the church, to my family, and to our society. Help me to listen attentively, to ponder prayerfully, to respond generously, and to benefit from the solitude and peace. Please send your Holy Spirit into my heart to touch me and to make me calm. Restore in me joy and stability for which I have known you. Through the intercession of Mary, Mother of Sorrows, may I and my fellow retreaters leave this retreat as deeply committed Christians, better able to follow your footsteps in all the opportunities and challenges of life as we journey in preparation for the coming of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, we have Father Tony in the room also. So, Father Tony, good to have you once again. And here at the background with me are uh, Matt, who is managing the camera and everything, and Paddy, who is managing the music and every other thing. So good to have all of you. So, Father Boniface, I will give you the floor now. And once you're done, We'll come back for questions and answers. Remember to sign to send me your questions as you listen. Welcome, Father Boniface. Thank you, Father Vin. I must say again that I'm very excited to be part of this um, highly interesting and engaging retreat organized by Father Vin and the family apostolate. Uh, like Father Vin said, I have a very delightful narrative with him. We come from the same state in Nigeria. Uh, we attended the same seminary. Uh, we both play soccer. He's very good. I don't know if he's still playing now. Maybe he switched to American football. <laughs> and um, there's something that we do together. He will laugh hard when I recount this. In the seminary, we have a very quiet place where we go to read. We hide to read, um, especially during exams. So we go there and it's a very quiet corner. And there's another priest that always comes to stay with us. Well, he's not a priest. He was still a seminarian then, but he's not a professor in the seminary. So we go there to read during exams. And I know that Father Vin recalls that experience with so much delight. So um, I want to introduce myself. I am Father Boniface, like he said. I, I come from a family of eight. We have um, six males in the family and two females. I am the last. I call myself an accidental child. Sometimes I ask my mom, why do you guys decide to help me when you already had seven kids? And she never answered that question. She just laughed. I know I was accidental, so they don't need to tell me that <laughs> coming last. Anyways, I have two of my brothers here who stay in Seattle. And I have a lot of brothers of mine in England and um, some part of Europe. My two sisters stay in Nigeria. My mom prefers to stay in Nigeria than to stay here, though she could stay here or she had all it takes to stay here. Um, she's 81. She turned. 81 on the 3rd of May, 4th of May, sorry. So I'm in the Archdiocese of Newark, and uh, my parish is Church of Epiphany, Cliffside Park. Some of my parishioners are here. Hey, show your hands wherever you are. 
I know there are somewhere there, uh, largely members of our Bible study. So because of this program, we cut off the Bible study for this week so that we can have the opportunity to attend this very refreshing retreat. But I mean, thank you very much. They always, they have been commending and most of them are excited to join this retreat. So I've been a priest for 18 years. Uh, I'm very much excited about my priesthood. Um, I would like to be a priest over and over again. Um, I love to, to preach and teach. Those are my passions and I love human development at all levels. I love to have people. I like, I, love, I, like, I like to read and write and sometimes I also sing. Who doesn't? So, just like Father Vin said, the, the topic is something that you'll be wondering. I tried to check out if someone really have done something on that. There is nothing in, there's nothing connected to witnessing in transit. I don't know what, where you guys got that stuff, or that idea. But, wow. Thank God we have a way of looking at it. And I believe that it will also be exciting or also be interesting for all of us to, to share from that. By the way, we need to appreciate God for his grace and mercy upon us especially as we have been passing through this pandemic. If you are connected in this retreat, that means you are alive, you are breathing. You even have the opportunity to refresh yourself spiritually. That is something exciting, something interesting, something that we should thank God for. More than 270 people already there in the cemetery and you are still alive. It can only be by God's grace, just by God's grace that we're here. So, in your heart, in your private moment, take some time to appreciate God. God is really good. He is wonderful. He is blessing us and he will keep blessing us. So, um, yeah, talking about that, let me tell you a story. I like to tell stories anyways. Let me tell you a story. So within this time, a couple, this man and the wife, they were so scared about the virus trying to look for the way forward. So they were having this discussion, right? And, and the man and the man said to the wife, what if I get the virus and die? Will you remarry? And the wife says, by God's grace, you will not die. And also, I won't remarry. If you die, I will stay with my sister. After some time, the wife asked the same question. What if I get the virus and die, will you remarry? The man said, no, no. By God's grace, I will stay with your sister. Yes, everything is by God's grace. So we live by his grace. We will continue to live by his grace. So what I will do now is for us to give some kind of definition to this very unusual topic, which will become usual after this retreat. So after this retreat, when somebody search, will search through and browse through to look for witnessing in transit, at least you find it with the family apostolate. It will be good for us to attach some kind of definition to some of the key words there. The first being to witness. Um, I know most of us might understand what witnessing means. That's to acknowledge that you saw something to acknowledge that you touched something, you felt something, you, you tested something, you know, something, some kind of personal account of your experience, the personal account of one's experience. That's what witnessing is. It is normally used in the legal field when someone has to come and testify in a court about an experience or something that could potentially help to solve a problem. And for someone to bear witness or testify, you have to take an oath. That means you are doing that under, under oath. But here, you are talking about witnessing as Christians. Witnessing as Christians. The oath we have to take is our baptismal promises. That we reject sin, we reject Satan, we reject all the promises of the evil one. Our baptismal 
commitments will become our oath in our witnessing. So we look at also the word witnessing. Um, just for us to understand, just give meaning uh, to what we're saying. So when we talk about witnessing, we're talking about giving an account, but we're talking about transit. It means moving from one location to the other. Moving from one location to, to the other. It could be said like when you are in a journey, um, when you are going from one point to the other, you are in transit. So if we are looking at this transit from the point of view, from the physical point of view, we might not get the whole point. So we'll be looking at it both from the physical point of view and also from the spiritual point of view. Because essentially, life is a journey. And most of my reflections, I tell people that life is a journey. Or most of the time, people hear me say, in this journey called life. And this journey called life. So life is basically a journey. So it now, when we put these two together, we're talking about witnessing means like giving account of your experience as you pass through life as you go from one point to the other, using the facility of your baptismal conviction, your baptismal promises to recount, to connect with people about your experience of Christ through various ways, which we shall find out in this, in this talk. Being able to tell people about Christ, share your experience of Christ, your personal experience of Christ, as you move from one point to the other, both physically and also in your spiritual life. So for us to have some kind of foundation, let us look at some, what might be called the biblical um, accounts or some biblical stories or some biblical instances that will help us understand what it means to uh, to witness so i will begin with abraham if you go to genesis chapter 12 you understand that abraham met god or god called him out from his family from his father's house from his tribe and god said to him I'm going to take you to a place. God did not name the place. So from this point of view, our father in faith, Abraham, now set out on a journey. And on this journey, he's going to make an experience with this God he did not know. Remember that he was pagan. What we call pagan is that he was worshipping maybe another God. Not the almighty God. So God was trying to reveal himself to him and God now asked him to leave his father's house to leave his place to a place he will show him. So I will say that this is the inception of this witnessing in transit. Abraham started off. He didn't know where he was going, but he moved with the wavelength of faith, moving as God directed him. And you find out that he had a lot of encounter with God on the way. The first altar he built was when he was still in transit. I remember also in Genesis chapter 18, when Abraham was staying by the tent, remember there was no house, he was just staying in the tent. This is just part of being in transit because staying in the tent means that that is not your permanent place. You are still on the move. So when Abraham was still dwelling in the tent, Genesis chapter 18 tells us about a, something that happened, a narrative about three men who were passing by, who were in transit, and Abraham stopped them. And asked them to come in for a drink. And from there, there was a discussion. And he asked them for a, to stay for a meal. And after that, that was the time he was promised. Or God promised him that he was going to have a child. Remember, the wife left. So all these things were happening while he was in transit. We also know the story of Jacob. In Genesis 32, from verse 22 to 32. Jacob was running away from his brother Esau. After he took his birthright, we know the story. But then while he was in transit, 
he had this dream of a ladder coming up from to heaven, angels were going up and down. And that same night, he wrestled with God. This was happening while he was in transit and experienced an, an encounter with God happening while he was in transit. We also know the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses encountered God at the burning bush. Moses was in transit. He was taking care of the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and then he, he saw this bush that was burning but was not consumed. And then he wanted to go nearer to find out what was going on. And God, he had a voice that said he should remove his sandals, but he was standing in a holy place. And then God revealed himself to him as the, fact, the God of their father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the one who made a promise. And then sent him on a mission to deliver the people of Israel, or to bring the people out from Egypt to the promised land. And this was happening after 400 years, the people were in bondage of slavery in Egypt. So this encounter of Moses was in transit. Now the people of Israel left Egypt. If you start reading from Exodus chapter 13, and then in Exodus chapter 14, they had to cross the Red Sea. This was happening in transit. God showed his power and might through a Moses whom he used to divide the sea and the people passed on dry shore. God was still showing himself to the people in where they were still in transit. We also know that they came to the place where they, they came to the Mount Sinai. If you start reading from Exodus chapter 19 from, from, uh, to chapter 20, where, Abraham, where Moses also got the, the Ten Commandments. So God showed himself, his might, he appeared to the people, he ministered to the people. Moses had a lot of encounter with God while they were still on transit. Remember, these people were on transit for 40 years. So there's no way we can say that this was outside the ambience of witnessing because God was showing himself to the people. They were trying to learn about God. They were trying to understand this God. For 40 years, they were in transit for the promised land. So these are some of the instances in the Old Testament I was able to like bring out so that we can reflect upon them. There are other instances, but I want to go over to the New Testament. And in the, in the New Testament, we see this happening also with the, starting with the ministry of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And the ministry of Jesus Christ was basically a ministry in transit. The Galilean ministry was in transit. It was in transit that Jesus called his first disciples. If you go to the account of Matthew chapter 4 from verse 18 to 22. Remember the calling of Simon Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were fishermen. This was happening while Jesus Christ was in transit. And there are other people also Jesus called while he was on transit. Remember Matthew? Remember also the encounter he had with, um, with Zacchaeus? When he asked him to come to his house that we see in Luke chapter 19. Now, the, there are other healing instances. For instance, the healing of the woman with the issue of blood we see in Luke chapter 8 from verse 43 to 48. Jesus was moving in the crowd. In fact, actually, a man invited, invited him because the, the child who was 12 years died. Jesus was on his way to, to Jerry's house when this woman showed up. And Jesus was in transit. And this woman saw Jesus in transit. And then she, she used that opportunity to touch our Lord Jesus Christ. Because she said to herself, she didn't say to anyone. She said to herself, if only I will touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And that's a lesson for us. When you have something very great to do, pray to God. Sometimes when we tell people, they will discourage us. Maybe if she told, she told a friend or someone, a family member, they would ask her not to go. Remember what happened to Bartimaeus, the blind man. Also, Jesus also, met Jesus also while in transit. We see that in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10 from verse 46 to, 46 to 52. He was, Jesus was in transit. So this woman, seeing Jesus in transit, used that opportunity to gain her healing. And when she touched, she was healed. 
And that was an intentional touch she had on Jesus on transit. I want to tell you, when Jesus was touched, Jesus stopped, remember the story, and said, who touched me? And the disciples were like, there are many people in the crowd. Many people, have, many people are touching you, so why do we ask who touched me? And Jesus said, no, someone touched me. So there could have been about three types of touch in that crowd. There are many people who touched Jesus Christ accidentally. It was not intentional. They touched him by just without even knowing they touched him because it was a lot of, a lot of people. There may, could have also been some people who touched Jesus Christ because they want to establish some kind of familiarity. Like, oh, I, I touched him. Oh, this man, I touched him. I have touched him before. If it were to be in our own time and day, some people will go with their phones and take selfies, you know, like to show familiarity. But in the midst of all these people, one woman among all the people in the crowd said, I am going to touch because this touch is going to transform and change my life. I'm not going to make an accidental touch. I'm not going to make a familiarity touch. I'm going to make an intentional touch that will change me, that will transform me, that will get me out from 12 years of suffering. And as she touched the Lord, her life changed. The source of the blood, the Bible said, dried up. Sometimes I begin to also wonder that most of us touch Jesus every day. We even have the privilege of holding him in our, in our heads. What really happens when you touch Jesus? Do you touch him accidentally or familiarly? Wives, maybe I always receive communion or um, people are going, let me go. Or when you're coming to touch Jesus, do you tell yourself like that woman, I'm going to touch Jesus and I know that something will change in my life. I'm going to touch Jesus, I know that I will be changed. I'm going to touch Jesus, I know that this sickness will give way. I'm going to touch Jesus, I know that this situation I'm facing will now give way to the grace and the power of God in my life. I want you to try it. Next time you want to touch Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, be very intentional, be very prayerful. Don't just get up from your seat and start going. Be intentional that when I touch Jesus, something will change in my life. When I touch Jesus, I will be healed. When I touch Jesus, something new will happen in my life. My dear friends, these are all other things happening. Remember the story of the 10 lepers in Luke chapter 17. They were on transit. Jesus was on transit. And then they saw Jesus and they said, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Already they, Jesus knew what they wanted, they wanted from him because they were in a colony of lepers. And Jesus told them, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were healed. They were cleansed. The first thing is that they were cleansed. And one of them, finding that he has been healed, came back to Jesus Christ. And to give thanks. This, all these things were happening while they were on transit. Remember the cripple of John chapter 5 from verse 1 to 15. A, a man was at the pool of Bethesda, sitting there for 38 years. This man could not be healed because the narrative of the scripture tells us that sometimes an angel of God will come from heaven and steal up the waters and the first person that gets in there will be healed and this man had been there for 38 years no one was able to help him get into the pool but on this day jesus was passing by jesus was in transit and when jesus saw this man who was also in transit because but he had difficulty in his own transition because nobody could help him to transit into the pool and he was there until Jesus passed through, Jesus was transiting. Jesus was not transiting for nothing. He was passing through in order to bring healing to him. The man was there for 38 years until Jesus showed up. And he asked the man, do you want to be healed? And he was thinking that it was going to be a, a physical healing, that Jesus could help him transit him to the pool from where he was. But Jesus was not talking about that kind of healing. And the man said, and right is so, there is no one to help me. That means no friend. There are times when you'll be in situation when every friend will leave you. Even brothers and sisters will abandon you. But I remember what the word of God says in Psalm 27, verse 10. It says, even if father and mother will forget you, I, the Lord, will take care of you. So Jesus Christ come to take care of this man. And he asked him, what do you want? 
Say, no one can help me. And Jesus asked him to take up his mat and work. And the man obeyed and he started working for 38 years. This man was there, but something happened one day. It could be your own story. It could be you are looking for something and it is taking time. And you're wondering, when will this be over with my finances? It could be a relationship problem. It could be something bothering you. You have tried. Yes, you have tried. You want to give up. You want to give up. I, I don't want to stay there. Maybe the man could have also gone home. What if he says to himself, 38 years, what am I still doing here? Let me go home. Maybe Jesus would have met someone else. Or maybe nothing would have been heard about him. But he stayed in the game. Sometimes the only thing you need to do is just to be consistent. Stay in the game. Don't look up. Don't, don't ever, ever give up. And I want to tell you something. When you get so hard in life and you want to check out, before you check out, check up and see if God is near. He could be very near to you. And that was what happened. Remember, this was happening as Jesus was in transit. He was in transit. Now, I want also to give you some instances with the parables of Jesus. In some parables of Jesus. Examples from the parables. Look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is a perfect example of witnessing in transit. Two individuals were in transit. A man was coming back, the other one was going. So this other man, maybe he had money or something, and then he met thieves and robbers on the way. They took his money, wounded him, and left him half dead. And then there were people who were passing by. This man was leaving Jer Jerusalem. He left Jerusalem, the, the place of peace, and he was going to Jericho. Jericho happens to be some kind of dangerous. He left the region of peace. Jerusalem means the city of peace. He left the area of peace, the territory of peace, and he was going to the place of pressed vine, a place where he would be crushed. And he fell into the hands of brigands. They dispossessed, they dispossessed him of what he had, and they left him half dead. Now, something happened. Some people were passing by, they left him. All these people were in transit. But there was someone who was in that journey who made a difference, a Samaritan. A priest passed by and could not do anything. A Levite passed by but could not do anything, and others. But a Samaritan was passing by, still in transit, and he stopped to help this man. Took him to an inn, paid for his treatment, and also promised to always come back to check on him. All these things were happening in transit. Jesus used it as this parable to teach the lesson that we need to be there for one another. It is a deeper expression. It is a perfect example of how we can be there for one another, especially those who are in need. And this was what Jesus Christ used, a parable showing how we can witness in transit, see someone in need, someone you do not know, someone that is unconnected with you, both by tribe, by language, by, by religion, but being able to stop to help because here is a human being that needs help. Other people who pass by, we are asking, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Like the priest, I'm a priest, I will be defied. What if he's dead? I will not be able to perform my duties. The Levite, oh, if the priest could not stop, why would I stop? He had a reason for himself. But the Samaritan said, if I don't help this man, what will happen to him, not to me? And that was why he said, my friends, this happened in transit. We also know the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 from verse 11 to 32. The boy left the house. He felt he could be by himself. He left the, the comfort of the family. And he wanted to be by himself to begin to enjoy life the way he wanted. And he asked his father to give him his own share of their estate. The father did not argue. He gave him and he left. And he went to a distant country. Remember, the, the scripture says a distant country. We don't have, have the name of the place, but call it distant country or a far country. That means this is a place that is disconnected from the father. And that is as far as he is from his, the love of the father. In the distant, distant country, nothing lasts. There will be famine. Everything seems to be going one way, but in a little time, you begin to face lack. 
you begin to lose it. That was what happened to him. And then he was in a distant country. Remember, this was a story of someone in transit. Look at the back and forth. He left the house to a distant country. In the distant country, something was happening that was not good. Then he wanted to come back again to the father's house. This is movement, transit. And in, within that time, he had an encounter, an encounter. At the time, he was in lack, and he hired himself out. When he could not support himself again, he now came to his senses. This is a point of, re, of return. If you, there is no way you can repent without coming to your senses. Because sin makes us to lose our spiritual senses. Repentance means when you come back to your spiritual senses. And he came to himself, as some, some translations will say. He now remembered what he was missing. Then he had to travel back again. This is transit. Back to the Father. And then he, re, he, he recounted or he reversed or he rehearsed what he would tell the Father. I, 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 don't, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I don't deserve to be called in your, one of your child. Take me as one of your servants. But the Father was not ready to take that. He asked him to come in and he gave him all he lost. Nothing. He did not lose anything anymore. This happened in transit. Let me go over to tell us a little bit about this situation in the passion and death of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was arrested in transit at Gethsemane. He was arrested at Gethsemane. At Gethsemane, Jesus suffered in the hands of the devil. At that time, he was going to a lot. That was the real passion. Somewhere, some translation says that the sweat coming out from his face was like drops of blood. He was going through a tormentous moment, a torturous moment. And that was the time he was like, can I go this way or not? Will I drink this cup or not? And at some point he says, Father, not my way, but let your will be done. This is the perfect prayer. That's the, the best prayer you can ever say. Father, let your will be done. In any situation you will be passing through in life, I, I want to tell you something. The will of God is perfect. The plan of God is so great. You can't change it. Somewhere the Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, it starts reading from verse 11. It says, God says, I know the plan I have for you. It is not for destruction. It's for your peace. So that you have a future with hope. So God is not planning hopelessness for you. I wouldn't know the point where you be in your life at this point in time. It could be at you could be going through your Gethsemane moment. Gethsemane moment is a time when you are so pressed down, when you are shaken, when you have to make a decision, when you are drawn apart, when you have to allow the will of God to happen in your life. And sometimes you want your way to be done. At that time, you have those inner struggles, those inner questions. You don't even know what to do. That's your Gethsemane moment. It was a time of transit for Jesus. And from Gethsemane, Jesus was taken in transit again to Gabata. Gabata at Gabata, Jesus was tried. He suffered in the hands of men. He was condemned by human beings. Crucify him, crucify him. This is still in transit. After all the back and forth with Herod and Pilate, finally what happened was Jesus was condemned. This was still in transit. And he was taken out from, from Gabata. Jesus was now on the way to Golgotha. Now, you remember the, the word of the cross. The word of the cross shows us a pictorial, a pictorial understanding of this transit. Jesus moved. This was a, tra a transitory moment. And on this transit of the word of the cross, Jesus was bearing witness through the things that happened. Remember the four. These are significant events. He fought three times, and uh, three times he rose again to tell us that when we fall, that's not the end of our lives. Even when you hit a brick wall, insofar as you have life, there is reason for you to rise again and start moving. We see Veronica wiping the face of Jesus. That shows us that in transit, we are expected to wipe the face of one another. We saw uh, the, the Simon of Syrian, Simon of Syrian, sorry, who came to help Jesus Christ to carry the cross. We need to help each other carry the cross. We saw when Jesus was to be buried, another man came, Joseph of Arimathea, to help give him the tomb. 
presented his stone, he, he met for himself as a present to the Lord. All these things were happening in transit to the cross. And on the cross, Jesus died. Remember, in John chapter 19, verse 30, he says, it is finished. That was when he paid the price for our sin. All these things happened in transit. And at the end, there was redemption. Jesus bore witness to the end. He took the punishment that was meant for us. He was chastised for our sake, as the word of God will tell us in Isaiah chapter 53. He was punished for our sins, but by his wounds we are healed. And all these things happened in transit. He was flogged, he was crushed on the pillar. All these things were happening in transit. So from Gethsemane, we go, he went to Gabata. From Gabata, he went to Gogota. And that's the end of that phase. Then the next thing that happened was the resurrection, which began, began a new story. We also remember the event of those who were, when Jesus rose from the dead, the young people who were going to Emmaus, and they were discussing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is witnessing in transit. Very significant. They were not talking about other things. They could have been gossiping. They could have been talking politics. They could have been making jokes, irregular jokes, dirty jokes. But they were with, talking about Christ. And because they were talking about Christ, Christ appeared in their midst. Let our discussion be about Christ. Sometimes we waste our times on things that do not matter. If the way we discuss politics and kill ourselves over politics is the way we talk about the word of God, just like we are doing in, in this retreat, we are, not, we are taking our time to talk about God, about our souls, about our Christian life. If that is the way we do that every day, our lives will be better. We waste our times. We waste our moments talking about things that do not matter. On the way to Emmaus, on this transit, these guys were witnessing to Christ, and Christ appeared in their midst. And remember what happened when he came, he started telling them about himself. They didn't know about him. They didn't know he was the one. And he opened the scriptures to them. The word of God said that they were struck in the heart. And they, they, didn't want, they didn't want him to go. When they came to the point where they have to go, he said, please stay with us. And Jesus stayed with them. And that night, while they were eating, he took bread and opened, and their eyes opened, and Jesus vanished. They met the Lord because they were witnessing about Christ while in transit. Now, I want to quickly go over to what happened during the apostolic times, the apostolic era. First would be the Pentecost witnessing in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. There we saw that the apostles received the Holy Spirit. And when they received the Holy Spirit, what happened? They came out. They were in hiding before. The word of God told us before, in John chapter 20, they were hiding because of the Jews. But by the time they received the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus told them already in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, from verse 8, that they would have to stay in Jerusalem until they received the power from on high. And when they received the Holy Spirit, they could not hold it. They came out and began to do what? To witness. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 from verse 7 to 12 tells us that travelers from all over the world from Rome, from Egypt, from everywhere in the world, they heard them witnessing about Christ. These are people who are in transit and they heard people witnessing to about Christ. And some of them went home with this message. That was how the message about the resurrection of Jesus Christ was able to spread throughout the world. It went viral because of the witnessing of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. We saw also in the Acts of the Apostles the story of Stephen. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, from verse 54 to 60, this guy was witnessing to Christ in transit. And that was how he was killed, the first Christian martyr. He was killed while witnessing to Christ in transit. We also know the story of Philip. The Philip, the one who converted the Ethiopian eunuch. You, you can read that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, from verse 26 to 39. Philip was taken by the Holy Spirit to meet a man who was trying to read the scriptures but could not understand. And the Holy Spirit gave him utterance, and he witnessed about Christ to the man, and the man was converted, and they saw his trip, and the man said, what prevent me from being baptized? And he was baptized immediately, and Philip was taken away, witnessing in transit, my dear friends. We now look at the story of Saul, who became poor, 
in Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 from verse 9 from verse 1 going he was a zealous Pharisee who was trying to stop Christians remember and he was on his way to Damascus to stop the Christians to kill them and then he encountered Christ an encounter that changed his life light came from somewhere and blinded him he thought he was seen before but he didn't know he was blind but when the light of Christ came he became blind to show that he was he has been blind and when he was spread over, scales fell from his eye. That was when he started seeing again. And now he saw in the new way. He thought he was seen before. He was not seen. But when after that encounter with Christ, he saw in a new way. So his conversion was in transit. And that was why St. Paul became a minister or an apostle in transit. Paul was always moving around. We know where he, all the places he wrote letters to, he traveled. Went to the Corinthians, he went to, to Corinth, he went to Galatia, he went to a lot of places preaching the word. And finally he went to Rome to appear about his case in, in, before the emperor. That was where he was be, beheaded and he died, witnessing to Christ in transit. Now there are other instances, but because of time we have to end here. But before we end, we have to go over to ask ourselves this question. How do we witness to Christ. How do you witness to Christ? How can we witness to Christ? And my answer is we can witness to Christ through war. War. That's funny, right? War. W-A-R. War. To go to war. <laughs> Don't mind me. That's an acronym. War. We witness to Christ in transit through war, W-A-Y. War, from my own understanding here, means first, true words. True words. We have to share our experiences with Christ, testify about Christ. We have to witness through our actions. Our actions. Actions speak louder than voice or louder than words. Then finally, we have to witness through our reactions. First, to be true words. And these words must come from our heart. The word of God says that these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are way out of heart from me. We have to witness true words that come from our heart. Our actions. Remember, Jesus says that we need to reflect him. We need to reflect him when he was talking to the apostles in John chapter 13. As I have done to you, don't do to others when he was washing their feet. And then our reactions. Christians are not supposed to react in a very negative way, especially when you're in transit. Try to react in a way. When someone slaps you on the right cheek, remember to turn to the other cheek, as the word of God tells us in Matthew 5, 39. I want to end here because of time. Remember, this topic is very rare. So it is also good that we take to some time to explore it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Father Vin is giving me a sign that I have spoken a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Father Vin, nobody can hear? Okay, yes. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Hey, Father Molikins, yes, I was here giving you a sign because uh, we are running out of time. But this is quite, quite an interesting topic. Thanks. Yeah, um, taking us through it's the scriptures, much taller than me. it's like an adventure with the scriptures from the Old Wait, Testament so through back. the New. I didn't think about it this way. I didn't think about it in these details with um, beginning from the patriarchs until the time of Jesus and his apostolic mission. So thank you so much. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. So my dear friends, um, we are already at, uh, at the threshold of time. But Father Boniface raised quite some, some interesting issues here. So witnessing in transit involves an encounter. It's an encounter. That's the thing. And that encounter is with our lives 
It says words and actions. And as you do that, you keep encountering Jesus and encounter Jesus in others. I think about traveling and getting to the airport as an example. The final body face now, my first question is, is it possible for Catholics to see a priest at the airport and seek to go for confession while they are in transit? Yes, I think I've done that before. I was, I was, I was somewhere actually in the airplane and I brought up my rosary and he started a conversation with someone and that led us to a lot of things not excluding having this, uh, receiving this facility. So it is possible. And that is why priests must always be ready if you are traveling to have a little bit of your, your tiny stole, your tiny things around you so that that will help you to attend to anything that comes on the way. So it is possible, very, very possible. Prayer, confession should not be only in the church, or in the confessional, it can be done anywhere because it's also a part of one of those sacraments we can do anywhere. Okay. Yeah. You know, we started the drive through confessions during the COVID. So yes. we will be flying through confessions now. <laughs> and I saw it happen. That's why I'm asking. But the priest uh, presented the opportunity, and before he knew it, the line was building up at the airport. And he's like, well, guys, I'm going to miss my flight here. So anyway, but this happens. Now, somebody wrote here, this is a great concept to meditate on. How do I touch Jesus in communion? Is it accidentally, familiarly, or intentionally? Yeah, you have to make up your mind to be intentional about that touch. And that means Catholics are always advised to prepare before you, before coming to church generally. You have to make sure that you know you are going to make an encounter with Jesus, not just coming to church, that you are going to receive him. And that is why we are asked to observe this one hour fast. That is to put us in the mood that we are going to encounter Jesus Christ. So your prayer should be, Lord, let me encounter you intentionally. And let it not just be that I'm just going to church because others are going, but I'm going to have an encounter that will be transforming in my life. I make a prayer point. Like, this is what I want you to do. I need you to do in my life. Something that is needful, not what you want, but what's something you need in your life. So, I have another question here that says, should we view our entire life on earth as being in transit? since this isn't our final home. And therefore, is the mindset of being in transit something that we should work harder to maintain? Yeah, like I said, uh, we should understand life as a journey. Life is a journey. And it ends not in death, but in death it is transformed. Right. That's our belief in the church that life is not ended but changed, transformed. So it's a journey, essentially a journey. And in this journey, the fuel of this journey is the Holy Spirit, that whom we are connected with. You know, it is not about our physical life, essentially, though we move from one point to the other, it is about our spiritual life. So life is a journey, and we should see it as we are in transit. And our destination is not uh, that block, the other block or the next block. Our destination is heaven. And our journey should be inspired by God's spirit. Thank you, Father. I think one of the things that touches me here is in practice, in practical terms, we all also encounter people in transit. Um, even in parishes, we have strangers who pass by. There are people who are confused because once you are in transit as a stranger, 
sometimes you get into things that you don't even understand. Cultural difference. You don't understand the culture. Societal difference. You don't understand the society. Um, even spiritual difference. Because the way a culture worships is different from the way another culture worships. So this kind of um, reminds us of who we encounter. You gave an example with Abraham, who encountered the, the strangers, without even knowing that those strangers are agents of God, and he welcomed them. So my dear friends, as you listen to Father Boniface this night, think about what this encounter means for you. While you imagine encountering Jesus, the question will be, where do you encounter Jesus? In whom do you encounter Jesus while you are in this transit that is called life? That is what I think uh, we can make out of this great talk tonight. So, Father, thank you so much. It's so good to see you. You see, I'm seeing you in transit. We've been in the U.S. now for years. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so great. We have great times back, back in the seminary. Uh, Thank you very much for that, being. Appreciate you. So, um, we don't want to go beyond 9 p.m. So please don't disappear, Father. Um, we're going to call you up again to give us your final blessings. But I want to remind everybody again that tomorrow we are starting with the 8.30 a.m. Mass. And immediately after the 8.30 a.m. Mass, we give a little break. And log in again by 9.20 a.m. Um, we will send you the link for logging in for tomorrow. It's not the same as today's own. We are going to use YouTube platform for tomorrow's uh, engagement. And I bet you will be good to end the process with us. It's going to be fine. But Albert already is with us and uh, we will hope we will end so well so that we continue this encounter with the Lord even as we transit to other things. Thank you everybody. Let us say the night prayer. Protect us Lord while we are awake. Watch for us as we sleep. That awake we may keep watch with Christ and asleep, rest with him in peace. Amen. God bless us. Father Boniface? Yeah. Okay, the prayers. Okay. Give us the blessing. All right. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the Almighty God, in His grace and love, bless you and sustain you. May He grant you a quiet night and a perfect end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirits. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night.